Welcome back, and we now move on to Chapter 6 of the Harris Plastner Textbook. If you're in the school year uh, schedule, uh, then you are starting a new session uh, with Chapter 6. If you are in the summer schedule, then you're continuing on in the same uh, session that had uh, Chapter 5, the one that we just talked about on the, the Greek goddess in the previous video. Okay, so let's get now into Chapter 6 uh, regarding the uh, Olympic Pantheon. I'd like you to please pause your video and take a look um, on page 170, 170 of your Harris Plaster textbook in Chapter 6. Now, while you're looking at the chart that's on page 170, I would like you to, to see if you could spot with an eagle eye one particular god who is missing uh, among all the names because that actually affects the number of gods who are thought to be part of the Olympic Pantheon, which we usually think of as 12. If you look very carefully at the, that chart, you may notice that one particular god is missing and that affects the number of gods who actually are um, comprise the Olympic Pantheon. Okay, so please pause your video and turn to page 170 of your Harris Plaster textbook. Okay, do you have page 170? Do you spot the missing god? <coughs> Well, I'm being actually kind of mean to you. I'm playing a very cruel joke because he's up here on the on the board. That one, Dionysus. If you notice, Dionysus, interestingly, is missing from that chart. And that actually uh, has important ramifications. We usually think of the Olympic pantheon, as we just said, as 12. Actually, it's 13. And the reason is that Dionysus is, is a later addition to the Olympic pantheon. So more on that coming up a little bit, but let's um, go, go to the chart as a whole so you can understand what's going on here. So as we talked about on the previous videos on Hesiod, um, the Olympic Pantheon comes about because of their birth from the Titans, and the Titans are listed at the top of that chart on page 170. They themselves are the um, offspring of uh, Gaia and Uranus from the first generation of, of gods after those original parthenogenic uh, creations, um, darkness, night, love, and so forth, uh, as described to us in Theogony of Hesiod. Okay, so you have the Titans. And then through their incestuous relationships, we end up with the first generation of the um, Olympic gods. So you've got the three brothers, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Itself a curious point, though, because Hades actually does not end up remaining an Olympic god since he ends up down in the underworld. And then you have uh, Demeter as well and um, Hera. Zeus and Hera are brother and sister, but they also become husband and wife after the manner of Kronos and Rhea in the generation before them, after the manner of Uranus and Gaia in the generation before them. So Hera uh, should be mentioned just briefly here. She does not fare very well as the wife of Zeus because Zeus has her as wife but has constant relationships everywhere else, the Bill Clinton of his day. So um, uh, Hera ends up with um, a very bad feeling about Zeus all the time because of, of not only the relationships he has with, with other ladies, but all of the illegitimate offspring that he has from them. And that includes many of the names that you see there in that chart. So Hera, ironically, is considered to be among the, the, uh, pan um, the uh, Olympic pantheon, the queen of the Olympians, as well as the mother goddess in charge of maternity and marriage, which is strange because she herself definitely has one of the most failed marriages that you can find uh, in, in divinity, uh, what one could say. Notice that Zeus and Hera themselves have a few offspring. Um, you have Hephaestus whom Hera actually produces by herself in anger at Zeus one day. And uh, because he is produced by himself parthenogenically, um, Zeus uh, uh, hates him because he looks deformed and just throws him uh, out of the um, Olympic uh, uh, palace's window for him to hurtle down to earth and land hard on the ground and, and break his foot and end up with a club foot. That's our god Hephaestus, the god of metallurgy, who thereafter is always lame which demonstrates, incidentally, that the Olympic gods are not at all perfect. Even though they are divine and immortal, they still have a lot of human imperfections, including some physical ones, and definitely a great deal of emotional ones, mental ones, and family-related ones. It's just like the uh, European uh, monarchies, the kings and queens, uh, many of them were, were beset with incestuous relationships and inbreeding. The more, uh, the more that happens, the more you end up with a great deal of madness and psychosis that, uh, that um, 
can um, vitiate the, the judgment of uh, those in, in leadership positions, which is why many of those uh, royalties were um, and royal families were um, corrupted in, in many ways. So it's, no, it's not too much different here. This, this family is pretty wild and, and, and crazy in many ways, and sometimes downright destructive to, to uh, uh, humans in ways that, 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 that humanity doesn't necessarily deserve. The flood, for instance, is, is one such example. Okay, so Zeus and Hera have a few offspring. They have Hebe, a goddess of, of uh, youth. They have Hephaestus in this incestuous relationship, uh, sorry, uh, parthenogenic relationship. And then finally they have Ares, that is the incestuous relationship. Uh, that's their own, only actual real son. And what a son. Ares is about as bloodthirsty and violent as you could get. He's the god of war, but all he represents is the, is the bloody aspect of war, blood and guts. He, he doesn't have any of the strategic wisdom that uh, we see with the goddess Athena. And uh, Ares is a pretty much rejected god among the, the, uh, the Greek gods, unlike his Roman uh, counterpart Mars, who is a very much respected and very important uh, god uh, for the Romans. In fact, Mars uh, is, is, is at the uh, forefront of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the family of Roman uh, founders uh, with uh, uh, Romulus Aeneas, uh, the, uh, the original um, refugee from Troy, and then later on uh, Romulus and Remus uh, directly, the two twins who, who uh, found the city of Rome. So Mars is, is, is really at the forefront of the Romans, but, and of course the Romans were devoted quite a bit to uh, expansion by warfare. But that's not the case with the Greeks. The Greeks really did not like war very much, and so their war god is definitely in a, in a um, subordinate, um, uh, uh, deviant uh, position. And his relationship with Aphrodite is kind of strange. We have, once again, just like we had with Eros and Eros before, with Hesiod, we, once again, we have love and war together, uh, Ares and Aphrodite. Aphrodite, ironically, is actually married to Hephaestus, the metallurgy god, but you can't stand him because he's uh, very um, club-footed and slow and lame. And so she's really attracted to the apparently really virile, really um, very well-built-up Ares, and she for some reason finds him really, really attractive, even though, again, he's uh, all he can think about is, is uh, blood and guts. Go figure. Anyway, so you've got the first generation of the Olympians. You have um, Zeus, Hera, Demeter, Hestia, Poseidon, and Hades. We take out Hades because he goes down to the underworld. We also take out Hestia, as it turns out. Hestia is the goddess of the hearth. And she has um, very little uh, mythology other than t attending the sacred fire in the Olympic Palace. Eventually, with the advent of Dionysus, more on him in a little bit, uh, she ends up getting shunted aside uh, to make room for this much more um, attractive and, and uh, um, ambitious god, uh, Dionysus, one, one who definitely uh, livens up Greek civilization a lot more than this very um, homely, uh, rather... Um, uh, excessively mundane uh, figure of, of Hestia, who does nothing except uh, to attend the fireplace. So she's really out of it. So effectively, the ones who are the real Olympic gods in the first uh, generation are Zeus, Hera, Demeter, and Poseidon, and that's really all for the for the first generation. Then, when you go down to uh, the direct births, you have um, Hephaestus, who's one of them, and you have Ares. The other two, Elithuia, uh, the goddess of, of uh, uh, midwifery and, and childbirth, and the, and the goddess Hebe, the goddess of youth, uh, do not in fact uh, uh, become uh, part of this, this actual Olympic pantheon. And then you go down to the generation after that. You have Athena, uh, who is in fact the daughter of Metis. You have Apollo and Artemis, the two twins, daughter of Leto. They're coming up in a future chapter. You have Hermes, the... Um, son of Maya, the nymph, and you have Aphrodite, this celestial Aphrodite, not the carnal one from the, the blood of, Krona, uh, of uh, Uranus, uh, she is the uh, daughter of Dion. So again, notice these illegitimate relationships, there's a discussion question about this at the end, these illegitimate relationships that Zeus has, which allows him to populate the Olympic world around him, giving him lots of reach in many different uh, aspects of, of um, immortal and mortal life, and also therefore a lot of power and influence. And so uh, despite uh, the complaints he may get from Hera, there's very little that she could do other than complain as Zeus spreads his influence and his manliness everywhere, far and wide, in order to have all of this influence. All right, so the second generation effectively is really all of these illegitimate children from Zeus, and all of them have various 
problems trying to associate with um, with with the other gods. Um, somehow, though, Athena, interestingly, gets along very well with Hera, despite her rather unusual birth out of Zeus's head. That seems to be somehow okay with Hera. But Apollo and Artemis, it takes uh, takes a bit of effort for uh, Hera to get along with them. And in fact, when it comes to the Trojan War, they end up on opposite sides. Apollo and Artemis support Troy. Hera is deathly opposed to Troy, as is, uh, incidentally, Athena as well. Um, Hermes um, has a bit of difficulty, as we see in the hymn, more on that later, uh, getting established in Mount Olympus as well. And uh, Aphrodite, um, the love goddess, um, does okay. But um, she and Hera, uh, again, are essentially on opposite sides. And we'll actually see how that plays out in Virgil's Aeneid, uh, the Roman work, with the, with the figures of Juno and Venus, who are on opposite sides of what's supposed to happen with Aeneas, uh, the uh, the Trojan hero uh, later to, be, to become... Um, uh, found, founder of the colony uh, for Rome. Okay, now, what about this figure Dionysus? So you have um, this big, crazy, ridiculous family. There's something, there's a discussion question about that. And then we have Dionysus who shows up on the scene, who, on yet another paramour of uh, Zeus, uh, in this case, uh, Semele. Uh, she's the mother of Dionysus. He goes through the, the, this, this uh, uh, double birth where he gets torn apart into shreds and then um, it gets, gets put back together again, and and, uh, uh, and Zeus ends up uh, 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 giving birth to him out of his thigh, which is of course a change from um, the um, head that uh, was the place where he gave birth to uh, to Athena. So it's Zeus's thigh uh, that produces Dionysus, and therefore makes him the, the ultimate carnal god, the god, the god, the god of, of wine and sexuality and all of that. Now. Dionysus himself is, is, is uh, even though he was born properly at Thebes, is almost uh, treated as a foreign god by the Greeks because of his wild and crazy manner, especially when, when he goes over to the east and rides on the backs of panthers and does all sorts, sorts of other really uh, crazy stuff. And he is, of course, quite sexual in his orientation. Uh, and uh, both the men, the satyrs who worship him, and the women, the menads, the men. Uh, 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 maidens uh, who go after him are just totally out of their minds whenever they go through the, the, the ecstatic worship of, of, uh, of Dionysus. So Dionysus, however, uh, underpins uh, Greek, Greek civilization and the Greek psyche uh, in very important ways. Greek civilization, because wine uh, is in fact a very important crop, not only for, for uh, consumption, but also for cooking and trade and many other uh, uh, aspects. And um, in addition, Dionysus also psychically represents uh, the aspect of civilization that allows one essentially to take a break, as it were, from law and order, like with the Saturnalia festival at, at the end of the calendar for, for uh, Rome, uh, being able to, to uh, uh, reestablish one's connection with nature, with, the, with uh, the natural world around oneself, allows one to return to civilization in a redeemed form and be able to, um, to associate better with, with proper law and order and society in, 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 a, in a positive way. So as such, Dionysus, therefore, really has very important cultural roles. And of course, he's also associated, especially in Athens, with the theater. And that's a big deal as well. So you can see that Dionysus, therefore, connects much more closely with humankind. And it's for that reason that he ends up displacing uh, the older goddess Hestia. It's for that reason that we do finally indeed end up with 12 gods, but that's only because of, of the uh, departure of Hestia from the original Olympic um, pantheon. So Dionysus is there, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be covering him uh, a bit later in Chapter 8. Okay, so that's what I have to say on the Olymp Olympic pantheon. You can read quite a few more details about the individual gods there in Chapter 6 and choose a discussion question to answer and also um, a student's response to yourself respond to. Uh, in the next video immediately coming up, we're now going to talk separately about the hymn to Hermes. Come on right back for the next video.